Our next speaker is Marianne Williamson. Yes, there we go. She is a world-renowned spiritual teacher, author, and lecturer. Marianne has published 10 books, including four New York Times number one bestsellers. Marianne is the author of the, the famous paragraph from her book, Return to Love. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Please give me a powerful round of applause for Marianne Williamson. A little louder, a little more powerful. My name is Farkunda Malikzada, and I am a passionate, free-thinking woman. I am 27 years old, and I consider myself very lucky to have been born into a family of academically inclined individuals in Kabul, Afghanistan. My father has been the lead engineer for Afghanistan's public health ministry for the last 40 years. It is because of his hard work that we even have any semblance of medical technology in the country. Of my brothers, the elder works in the Ministry of Finance and the younger followed by my mother's footsteps into the field of engineering. I am one of eight sisters. We are all in our 20s. We are all unmarried. We are all university graduates. Throughout the course of my studies in Islam, there is one Quranic imperative that embedded itself in my heart and mind, that it is incumbent upon every Muslim to stand against injustice. In Kabul today, the city is rife with injustice. Politicians take bribes, the media, take bribes, even students must pay bribes to take entrance or exit exams. But the people who are most at risk in this atmosphere of corruption are the poor and downtrodden. Their minds are easily manipulated and their livelihoods are threatened when those in power refuse to live by the Quranic ideals of mercy and compassion. I'm ashamed to say that although Islam has been a source of healing and inspiration for me, that religion has been used as a tool of seduction for the illiterate masses of pilgrims who come through this city. Imams and sheikhs all over the country have been responsible for the most heinous of crimes. And my intuition was telling me that one place in particular, the shrine of two swords, was veiling their indiscretions behind a curtain of religious authority. On a Wednesday afternoon, I attended Women's Day at the shrine and witnessed these poor women as they paid exorbitant amounts of money for amulets. These amulets, called tawiz in Farsi, are merely pieces of paper with writing on them. Only the Lord knows what was truly written on these papers, but the fortune teller was charging these women astronomically high fees for the promise that these scraps of paper would help their marriages, would produce a male child, would solve their problems with their mothers-in-law. I immediately confronted the shrine's custodian and the fortune teller saying, you are abusing the women. You were charging them money for something that is not Islamic and that is not religious. The custodian responded, who the hell are you? Who are you to say these things? Get lost. On March 19th, 2015, I returned to the shrine again to lecture the women on the fruitlessness of their actions, to tell them that their money was being spent in vain. 
To show how ineffectual they are, I threw them in the garbage. And that is when the nightmare began. The custodian fished through the trash, taking what I had thrown away in addition to some burnt pages of the Quran. He took these burnt papers as evidence to accuse me of the worst crime imaginable in that society, burning the Quran. He took to the street, and during one of the busiest times of day, he shouted to all the passers-by, a woman burned the Quran. I don't know if this one is sick or mentally disturbed, but what kind of Muslim are you? Go and defend the Quran. A mob of nearly 50 men gathered outside. I was trapped in the small office of the shrine with the crowd getting angrier and louder by the minute. I was trying to dispel the lies, but the crowd wouldn't listen to any reason. They were enraged, calling for blood. They called me an agent of America sent to destroy Islam. The police arrived immediately and attempted to escort me away, but I did not want the male officers to touch me. As they led me out of the office into the street, I pulled away asking for a female police officer. And that brief moment when I pulled away was the one that sealed my fate. For in that instant, the mob broke through. They began to beat me, dozens of men, with their arms, fists, legs, sticks, anything they could find on the street. The police couldn't hold back the mob, so two of them lifted me off the ground and placed me on the roof of a low shed. But the mob wasn't satisfied and continued to hit me with poles and planks of wood that were in the street. I tried to hold on, but my hands were bloody and I lost my grip, falling back down into the rabble. I struggled to stand up, and to my horror, they tore off my hijab, revealing the wounds on my head that had caused my bloody face. I looked up to see that while all this was happening, many of the men were recording their crimes on cell phone videos. The mob roared. They were kicking, jumping, as I was pummeled onto the ground. My body kicked around like a rag doll while I screamed for help, screamed for mercy, screamed in the name of God. Eventually, I couldn't scream anymore. There was too much blood. I don't know when I lost consciousness. It may have been before I was brought to the edge of the river bank and my limp body was run over by a pickup truck. That too, was not enough to satisfy their bloodlust. I was thoroughly soaked in my own blood, too wet to burn. So the men covered me with their jackets, doused in gasoline, and lit me on fire. When news of my murder first broke out, Officials from the police chief to the head of the religious authority condemned me and pardoned my murderers. A prominent imam added his congratulatory words of approval. But after an investigation revealed that I had been wrongly accused, the tables turned. Those officials were sacked. The imam couldn't save face and a string of arrests were made throughout the city. Remember the shrine keeper? The one who told me to get lost? It turns out he had a lot to lose if I had been successful in sending the women home. You see, he was managing the fortune teller's room in the shrine that was used as a base for his 
prostitution ring, Viagra, condoms, women's body wash, and pregnancy tests were found littered all over the room. In a revolutionary act of defiance, the women of the city carried my body to my grave and conducted my last rites. This had never before been done in the country's history. They famously stated, you men took her life. We will not allow you to dare to touch her in death. My killers were convicted and sentenced. Some were released. Some escaped the country altogether. Some of them had their sentences reduced. There are people working to take my case to a higher court, and I commend them. But my death did not end the corruption, and it will be an uphill battle for those advocates of justice. And that is my story. My name is Farkunda Malikzada. <laughs>